Good. Okay, are we up? Looks good. Okay, great, fantastic. So uh, this uh, session is the first in four. Uh, we're holding each of these in a uh, both a face-to-face -face session here at UF, University of Florida campus in Gainesville, Florida, followed by a, a recorded webinar session. Uh, and so uh, these first two slides, uh, and we can send you information if you contact me or Mark, we can send you information about uh, when each of these will be held. Uh, if you're local, you, you certainly can sign up for one of the workshops that are being held uh, here on campus. If not, uh, we'll be putting these webinars online. Uh, the, the way that we set these up is the first one is going to be just a quick overview and introduction to what Sobek, Sobek CM does, how it's used, in particular the slant that I'm going to be giving is as a collection manager, uh, what functionality am I looking for, what can I do with it. So that's what we're going to be covering today. Uh, quickly I'll just tell you that the uh, second session is on metadata editing, that's going to be all of the uh, information you need to know about how to uh, get your metadata in and edit it and and keep it updated in uh, Sobek CM. The third session is on the uh, QC online tool which we've just rolled out. Uh, this is a quality control uh, tool that allows collection managers and curators to uh, to basically make sure that the final digital product uh, matches what it should in terms of being a true representation of, of the original analog uh, materials. And I'm going to show you more about that uh, later in this session. I'm going to cover as much as I can uh, a little bit about each one of these, but you should know that if you want more in-depth about metadata editing or QCing uh, or uh, in-depth curator tools, and then you should definitely come through to uh, workshops two, three, and four for those. Uh, so again, uh, these were being recorded, and if you can't attend face-to-face you can always watch the recorded webinar online. So uh, let's get right into it. Sobexium, for those of you who uh, don't know, or as a reminder, if you already did know, is an, it's an open source digital library system. Uh, we've built it and maintained it primarily here by the UF libraries. However, it's, it's being co-developed in partnership with a variety of institutions. Uh, and that's, that last part there is extremely important in that th this certainly came out of the UF libraries, but it, by no means is it a UF only uh, digital library system. Uh, and I'm going to come back to that in a minute. It supports, uh, Sobex CM as a, as a digital library system supports a wide variety of, of resources. And basically, if you name it, we, we're supporting it or we're in the process of, of being able to support it. Uh, this list here is a small set of, of some of the typical types of resources that we handle, books, archival materials, maps, newspapers, AV, those kind of things. Uh, most recently, we, we've been delving more and more into data sets, which is one of the more advanced uh, resource types that we've been working with. Uh, file formats, it's open pretty much to all file formats. Uh, the caveat there is that we, we choose not to accept uh, executable files for security reasons, uh, and, but basically it's configurable uh, to handle all file formats. Um, one nice thing that I like about it is that uh, it's, it's flexible enough that a single object, a single digital object, can actually have uh, multiple file formats. Um, the best example of this, in my opinion, is like an oral history where you might have an oral history audio interview, maybe a video uh, interview, is, uh, maybe the interview is videoed as well. Uh, transcript and then a published copy of the oral history and each of those four file types can be saved together as one digital object uh, which makes it a lot easier for uh, discovery and use by researchers. Uh, metadata support, uh, Sobex CM strives to be uh, comprehensive as, as much as that's possible in this day and age of, of, multi of metadata types springing up every other day. We cover the biggies, uh, there's no doubt about it, and this is just a small list of the things that we do cover. Uh, but you'll notice uh, Mark, uh, Matt's Mods, Dublin Core, all, all the typical metadata that, that most of us deal with, most collection managers and curators deal with on a regular basis, uh, Sobek CM handles. Um, here's a good example of what I'm talking about here, and I know you can't see this image well on the slide, so I'm going to quickly I'll go over and see if I can give you a better view of this. Uh, 
again, I'm going to expand it a little bit, but you'll see here the circle in the middle is the uh, resource object, the, the largest circle. And then inside that you have all of the standard uh, metadata that's included in that resource object. And that might be uh, bibliographic uh, METS header, headers for those of you who know METS uh, and uh, technical metadata and everything else that might typically be found in a digital object. What's important about this image to me is the outlying, uh, and let me go in here and, and drill down a little bit. These outliers here are the uh, uh, all of the metadata schemes that you, we can also use. So in addition to the standard, here's what most digital objects have. Here, for example, is EAD, where we have a module that just handles the encoded archival description metadata uh, standard uh, for the archival community. Uh, below that, for example, we have uh, ETDs for electronic theses and dissertations. So basically, this, this slide, this graphic points out that in addition to all of the standard metadata, you've got all of these other metadata schemes that can be brought in, including custom, custom uh, metadata schemes. All right. And going back to the PowerPoint. Um, so BEXCM is interoperable, and uh, the, best the best example of why that might be important to you is that it automatically feeds content into OPACs. Uh, so for example, here in Florida, those of us in Florida who are using the uh, state system, that's Mango. Uh, and so the content that's coming out of, uh, of uh, SOBEC uh, goes right into your, your OPAC. Uh, it's also integrated with OAI PMH. This is the Op Open Archives Initiative Harvesting Protocol. Basically, if you know nothing about what that acronym means, and I'm not going to go into it now, uh, the, the, the take home message here is that your content can be harvested by those uh, harvesters that are out there. For example, the Internet Archive is a big one that, that many people have heard about. Oyster is another one where uh, there are these aggregates, aggregators uh, that are out there and they harvest digital content from, from around the universe and pull it together. And so uh, the SOBEC system is compliant with that. Um, SOBEC also uh, works well with search engine opt optimization uh, using uh, static pages, sitemaps, uh, RSS feeds, all of the little tricks that uh, web developers use in order to make sure that your page is a high hit uh, on a Google search results, for example. It's one of the first things people see. So CM builds that into, uh, into the system. And then finally, something that's, that's being developed now, that's a, it's a recent development, is that we have microdata uh, linked support at the item level. Um, I'm not going to go into this in too much de detail. Mark is actually the better person to talk about this. But this is, a, uh, this is functionality that allows you to go in and uh, you can take a resource and you can describe down to a very granular, very small, fine level of detail uh, exactly what the resource is. And where this comes into play later on is if you do a Google search, for example, I'm sure many of you have seen this, where if you search for a recipe for hummus, for example, uh, you, you will get a, a hit result that not only has a little thumbnail graphic with it, but it might have a cook time, or it might have a you know uh, number of ingredients or something like that, in addition to the link and the little uh, synopsis of what the page might be. That's microdata that's that's uh, that's feeding that information to search engines. Uh, so you, we could theoretically go into a resource in in Sobex CM and we could say not only is this an oral history, but this is a particular uh, this is the audio portion of an oral history recording. This is the transcript portion. This is the duration of that audio. This is the transcriber, the name of the person who transcribed it. And all of this microdata can be pulled up by, uh, pulled in by a search engine and, and made presentable. So all, uh, all of this information here on this slide is basically getting at the idea that your content, when, it, when it's in SOBEXCM, it's easy to get out and easy to make discoverable uh, because of how interoperable SOBEXCM is. Coming back around to uh, the, the issue of, of this, this is very much a community-developed uh, piece of uh, software, a system. 
just the way we started was that we were, there was primarily a group here in Florida, the University of Florida libraries in, in conjunction with a lot of partners in other state universities in particular. Um, we started developing this system and this grew to also having uh, partners and contributors from historical societies, museums, other repositories. And then we grew to go outside of the borders of Florida to the Caribbean in particular. Um, and uh, now we've just continued to expand from there. And the nice thing about this is what, what really, is, why I think this is so important is the more people you have participating, I think the better the system becomes and is becoming. We, we've seen that with Sobexium over the years that uh, having uh, such a large community, and this is just a very, this next slide is just a very small snapshot of uh, our community user group. These are only a few of the dozens and dozens of uh, participants and contributors. Um, that uh, this makes the system uh, stronger overall because you have not only all of the users saying, here's what we need, here are the functions we need, but you have other repositories now, like for example, Florida International uh, University. They're working on a large digital project using Sobexium and they're their programming code, which can then be fed back into the main um, code for the system. And uh, we hope there's going to be more of that where we have partners who are giving us code that they've developed uh, locally so that we can roll that out uh, to the entire uh, community. I should mention, by the way, I neglected, I'm, I'm you know, 10 or 15 minutes into this now, and I completely forgot to mention that uh, in addition to Mark Sullivan, who's the lead programmer of, of uh, Sobexium here at uh, UF Libraries, uh, and myself, uh, Lori uh, Taylor, who's un unable to join us today, she's the third person who set up these workshops, and uh, Lori Tabor Taylor is our digital humanities librarian here at the UF Libraries. And in addition to Mark and I, who will be fielding questions today, uh, Lori is another good contact for, for this information. Uh, I should have also started, I was so eager to get started, I jumped right in without saying that I'm an archivist in the uh, Department of, of Special and Area Studies Collections here at uh, UF. And I, I work with a lot of digital projects and I liaise frequently with the Digital Library Center here and with Mark and, and his team and in, in, um, in our uh, digital content, getting our digital content online. So that's one of the reasons why I, I, I'm giving this presentation as opposed to Mark, for example, because we're trying to give this as a perspective of somebody who manages content uh, that's served up in UFDC. Uh, so now, uh, now that I've jumped back and, and caught myself up on things I missed earlier, let's plow ahead. What I'm going to do in this next section is uh, go through the public interface fairly quickly. I'm going to try and hit the highlights, but there is no substitute for you getting in and playing around yourself. So I'm going to go through things in a fairly rapid fashion. I encourage everybody to uh, come back and do some complicated searching and browsing on their own. So the main public interfaces I'm going to talk about today are the UF Digital Collections Interface and uh, the Digital Library of, of the Caribbean. Uh, these are the two interfaces that have been around the longest and have had the most work done to customize them. Although there are other uh, inst instances of SOBEC out there that uh, uh, have, have their own public interface with their own look and feel. So uh, we'll, come, we'll touch on a couple of those as we go. But uh, just so you know, UFDC and Digital Library of the Caribbean or DLOC are the two I'll focus on. All right, uh, so I'm going to jump out now and actually take you through a uh, live view of this slide, but let's go out here. All right, so everybody should now be seeing our main uh, UFDC uh, homepage. Uh, I'm going to quickly show you, show you some standard elements that are on this page, and then we'll dr drill down to a lower level and, and talk about searching and browsing and some of the uh, menu options. So. It's fairly standard on our, our uh, pages for, uh, for UFDC and, and other instances of SOBEC that you're going to have the following elements. Those include the institutional bar here at the top. Uh, you've got this, um, um, oh boy, I always lose the, the banner. Thank you. I, I just can never keep that term in my head. Uh, the banner here. Uh, and this also includes the search box. This is a, a typical Google type simple search box. Um, 
There's a few commands here that are fairly standard. Anybody who's used bibliographic systems, catalogs, or digital systems where you can print, send uh, via email, add some things to your collections, and I'm going to come back and talk about that later, and, uh, and share materials through um, you know, uh, some of your social media uh, outlets. And then over here on the right is a, uh, a rotating image. This is highly customizable. You primarily see these when, when you're seeing Sobek instances. You primarily see these on main pages like this UFDC main page. But you can easily have this on lower level pages as well. It's a great way for highlighting uh, important, um, uh, important resources that you want to get people uh, make more discoverable for people, or if you just have something that's, that's that good that you want to share it up front, this is a great way to do that. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, okay, so drilling down the page a little bit, I mean moving down the page a little bit more. Um, this is fairly new. Uh, we've just recently, for those of you who have used any Sobek interfaces in the past, you will uh, remember that we, we had tabs that looked more uh, like this with the list view, the brief view, and the tree view that you see here uh, lower down. We've just rolled out uh, this new menu, which I personally like a, a lot better. It's, it's to me much more usable and, and intuitive to find what you're looking at. Um, the default is for the rest of the page here is to get a list view. As you see, you've got these main uh, sections, and then within that you have various collections, uh, digital collections. Uh, you can, however, change this view to a brief view, which is still very similar to the list view. The difference is that uh, now you I'll flip back and forth so you can see. There's no synopsis on the first one, and here you get a little one or two two sentence synopsis of what the uh, what the collection, the digital collection in, uh, consists of. And then finally, tree view. I find the tree view extremely useful uh, personally that it's a great way if you want to get in and quickly find something that you're not quite familiar where it is and a search isn't going to be the, the fastest way sometimes. Uh, you can, using these expandable or collapsible uh, boxes, you can quickly go in and, and drill down to a fairly finite level. Like, for example, we have a Cosmo Bailey Papers collection and special collections, and there happens to be a digital surrogate of that collection online. And yes, I probably could have searched for Cosmo and and hit and hit that pretty rev, uh, pretty quickly because there aren't that many Cosmos, I would imagine. But uh, if you were searching for something like you know, Albert the Alligator, for example, our mascot here at UF, uh, you might hit thousands and thousands of photos, or you might want to drill down to the University, of Archi University Archives photograph collection, for example, and uh, find that and just search in there for Albert uh, photos. So that's a good example of the tree view. Let's go back to our main default view, which is the list I'm going to get tired of saying this, and you're going to get tired of hearing it. Sobex is extremely customizable, so how, however uh, this displays is an institutional decision, and then when you drill down to a lower level, it's down to a collection manager curatorial decision in terms of how most of this is laid out. Now, there's some standard things that aren't as customizable, but frankly, most of the things that I've wanted to do in terms of where I want my text to be laid out, if, if on my collection page I want to have links off to the side and, and the graphics that are on the page, it's all customizable and I'm going to come back and talk about that more later. Uh, so it's not, you're not locked into this one look and feel. Good example of that here is, uh, I'm now flipped over to, I've switched over to the DLock page. They're slightly different. A couple of things I'll just point out quickly is that they've got more options on their menu bar than on the UFDC menu bar. Uh, they have a news section here where they've got uh, some uh, recent news updates, news announcements, those kind of things uh, they put on their page. So highly customizable in terms of the content that you find on these pages. Taking a quick look at the, uh, I'm going to come back and talk about searching in more depth in a, in a couple of minutes, but uh, 
the other option I'll point out here on the menu bar is the Browse Partners. This is extremely useful for those of you who, um, if you happen to be a partner, for example, you can just find your link here if you're looking for it. Uh, so if you're coming from the archaeology program in the city of St. Augustine, you click on it and there is all of, uh, there's your landing page for your collection. You can go out and see who the other partners are. And then also, uh, if you happen to be a curator or a collection manager and you have external partners, possibly as part of a, a grant project, this is a good place uh, where you can get in easily and find, okay, I'm working with uh, well, I'll use them again as my example. Right now we're engaged in a project funded by the uh, National Endowment for the Humanities uh, and uh, the archaeology program in St. Augustine is one of our partners. So I as a collection manager would come in and, and to easily get to all of the content donated by the archaeology program. I click right there and get to it. It's just one more way to get to the materials you're trying to get to in addition to searching. Moving down the page a little bit quickly, I'll just say that uh, you have all of the uh, groupings uh, down here. This is developed organically over time is the best way to say it, that uh, this is not a, uh, you know, we haven't gone out and found that there's a one standard way of doing this. Our, over, over time, our uh, digital folks and our curators, collection managers, anybody who's had a say in the matter has said, has uh, suggested that, oh, we should have an arts and humanities and social sciences section, a science and technology section. And then under that, we have these umbrella collections and sub-collections. And, uh, and so this, what we're looking at now has grown up organically over the years. This is something that changes frequently. I mean, it can change frequently. We may decide next week that we want to break arts and collections, for example, uh, into multiple uh, collections because we've stuck architecture and landscape architect, uh, landscape design under that umbrella and maybe it makes more sense to have an architecture uh, collection. Um, I used the example of the uh, Florida Archives, the University of Florida Archives earlier that's under Florida Photograph right now and, and we've recently uh, been talking about and we've done, uh, we've put a um, um, icon and, and title here, link here for the University Archives um, page. So all of that is to say that what you're looking at here is not prescribed. It's just something that's grown up that way and again is, is, is easy to change. <coughs> okay, uh, let's talk searching for a few minutes. Oh, actually, I'm sorry, I, I'm jumping ahead of myself. I'm so eager to do searching. Let's talk collections. Uh, so I've been mainly staying at what I would call the institutional collection level. So this is all of UFDC we're looking at right now. But you can drill down to lower levels and you'll see that the look and feel of these can change drastically depending on what you're looking at. Let's use uh, our Baldwin uh, Library of Children's, uh, Historic Children's Literature as our first example here, where when you come into Baldwin, again, you'll notice customizable, a menu, menu bar at the top that has various selections that you won't find in other collections. Uh, they've selected a graphic here on the right that when you click on it actually takes you into that uh, uh, image of that book that's been scanned. We're going to come back and see more of that image later. And then under this collection page for Baldwin, there are various sub-collections. So there was uh, something done for Alice in Wonderland, Grimm's Fairy Tales. And if you click down yet again, you'd get down to a, um, I guess what you'd call the, the, the bottom level or a sub-collection level. Uh, so within Baldwin, within UFDC, you have this Grimm's Fairy Tales uh, sub-collection. Again, very customizable. As a collection manager or curator, you just work with Mark uh, Sullivan and his team. <coughs> Sorry, I'm going to get a case, case of the coughs now. I'm going to take a drink really quickly. And you can set up sub-collections as needed. Um, um, there's been a, a lot of uh, work done in this by various collection, and cur various collection managers and curators. Some, some have very few um, of the sub-collections and they just re would rather have a collection level search uh, browse features. 
Others have quite a few sub-collections. Uh, so again, very dependent on, on a particular case. Uh, okay, let's flip back over really quickly. I want to make sure that I am, I have not missed anything. I touched on all of that. Oh, oh good, this was an important part. Uh, languages. So one of the things that I, th I think is really exciting about this, uh, about Sobek is that uh, more so than I've seen with other digital systems, and Mark can correct me if I'm wrong here, but I, I think we're far ahead of most other digital systems in this regard. Uh, because we have an international uh, group, uh, community group, um, we're a little bit ahead of a lot of others in terms of the uh, languages that we're making our interface available in. So uh, we've, we've had English, French, and Spanish rolled out for a while, particularly through our, our DLOC um, uh, partnership. And uh, we're soon to be uh, rolling out Creole and, and Papiamento. Um, and all of the languages are you know, we can we can make any language work basically as long as we've got uh, somebody who can help us come up with all of the text for the various uh, tabs and, and all of the navigation. Uh, it's, this is not just putting up content in these languages. This is making the entire interface available in that language. I'll really quickly take you over to DLock and just show you live that here's the DLock um, uh, homepage and you see right at the top here that you can switch from English to Spanish to French and everything changes. And this is, is just a matter of our, um, we took the time to um, make a Spanish language version of the Sobek system. So if some of you out there are dealing with Swahili materials or Russian or whatever the case may be, it's just a matter of, of you and or your partners um, of coming up with the uh, proper translations for all of the uh, links and, and heading and text information. All right. Okay, let's talk about searching. So, simple search, uh, the, the, like I showed you, that shows up on the banner bar <clears throat> is uh, the main default. However, we have advanced searching uh, capabilities. This is very typical, if, if again, for if you, any of you who have used bibliographic systems, digital systems elsewhere, uh, you're not going to be terribly surprised by what you find in the advanced search. Uh, there are multiple fields. You can do Boolean searching with and, or, not. You can do exact uh, phrases. Um, you can select which uh, subfield you want to um, uh, search in. One thing I will point out here, and I, I, um, I've, I've misspoke about this in the past, so I'll just uh, I'll state it here correctly. That is that uh, the, the fields that appear in the advanced search, uh, these are not customizable. You can't select which fields, at this point, which fields you want to be searched in the advanced search. What does happen, though, is Sobek is smart enough that, uh, that the programmers have programmed it this way, so that if there's no content in particular fields, it's not going to appear in the list. Uh, and that means that you won't get a list of 200 field uh, headings when there's only, for a particular collection, there's only 20 that are needed. And again, a good example of this might be um, the uh, uh, theses and dissertations, for example. If you have ETD content, uh, there's no reason why you, you need to have oral history transcriber or something like that uh, as one of your fields that shows up. So uh, this is a good example of, of where Sobek, I think, is, is flexible enough that on the fly it can, uh, it can help users get to the content they need in, in a faster fashion. All right, uh, let's go over really quickly and I'll show you a couple of these things <coughs> live. Uh, Simple search. I'm just going to search for basketball in the simple search. You will see here that uh, in the search results page that comes up, uh, the first thing you're going to see, and again, I'm hoping this is familiar to most people. It shouldn't be too wildly different than what you've seen before. You get a list of hits. Uh, and uh, each of these are links to the, the, the digital object page themselves. And most of them come with meta, uh, a brief uh, metadata 
particularly things like date or, or author or format. Uh, and then over on the left, you have your, um, your facets for narrowing and refining the search uh, results. So for example, uh, again, coming back to the example I used earlier, if I had searched for Albert the Alligator and I got 2,000 hits, I could have come over to the, um, the narrow by University Archives over on the left and just pick those, whatever that number is of, of photos from the University Archives. Um, and I'll just scroll down quickly to show you that we have a, a, a lot of different uh, uh, ways that researchers can, can narrow down their search results, language, uh, geographic region, genre, topic, that kind of thing. Um, search results are the, by default come out in the brief view and uh, the other option here is a table view. Just a straightforward, here's the link, uh, date, and click on it to get more. Or, and I find this fairly useful, uh, very useful, particularly when I'm looking at a lot of um, uh, photographs or, or drawings or things like that that are very graphic in nature, uh, the thumbnail view is, is a, a really great way to go. Um, of course, you have sorting options, and uh, you can um, navigate through your search results uh, at the top or bottom with the typical next, last, uh, first, previous buttons. Um, okay, we're going to see some examples of some more searches as we go. One other one I want to show you that's just being rolled out now is the uh, date search. Uh, this is being rolled out first. Oh, I, while I'm here, I'll just show you quickly. Here's yet another example of how customizable Sobek is. This is uh, New College, um, uh, their instance of Sobek. And uh, the New College page, if you go to their theses collection, you'll see right away that their default search looks different uh, for this collection than some of the others we've looked at already in that they have a, a date search here that you can limit. You only want searches from one year to the next. Uh, this is something that eventually is going to be rolled out uh, in, in all of the collections. Uh, the, the date search is something that's been wanted for quite a while, and, and we're happy to say that it, it's coming out. We're testing it right now, and, and in this case, New College is already, is already running with it. So uh, more of that to come. All right. Let's go back over here. Uh, let me show you. Okay, we're almost at a stopping point for questions. I know I've already seen a couple, but uh, let's just keep going. So, uh, searching, much like the interface itself, is extremely customizable. Uh, and uh, as I just pointed out with New College, that they've made a selection, they've made the, uh, the decision to start off with a keyword search box followed by the date right below it as their default. They could have easily just done that in the advanced search screen. And the date search is available in both the advanced and the, and the uh, default uh, simple text search. Um, there's also full text search. I'm going to show you an example of that. And you could decide to make your full text search your default search. Um, so to clarify the, the basic search that happens, the advanced search, those are searching the metadata for the digital objects. And that metadata uh, may or may not include full text, depending on, on what resources are and how it's set up. Or you could just have it set up uh, so that you're just automatically searching the full text uh, entirely. Uh, so I'll give you an example of that. We have a collect uh, project underway right, here, right now here at uh, UF where we are digitizing uh, several diaries in particular from, from Florida, journals, those kind of things. And, uh, most people, we anticipate most people coming to search those resources, it doesn't make much sense for them just to search diary 1893, for example, or 1912 or whatever it might be. Uh, they're going to be searching for particular content within the diary. So uh, we've made the decision that our default will be to search the full text rather than the uh, metadata uh, for that collection. Um, all right, let's go out and take a quick look at some of the examples of that. So, let me go back here. 
you'll notice I, I didn't go to this earlier, but I'm back on the UFDC uh, homepage now. Uh, simple search is the default up here. Advanced search there, as I showed you. Text search. Fairly straightforward, but uh, let's see. Well, let's just do basketball again since that popped into my head earlier, and let's see what happens. The nice thing about the text search is that uh, you get the uh, search results in context. Uh, so if you were to go and search, as I did in a text search, uh, I'm, I'm pausing because I just found it interesting that uh, I like the title here, LeBron James and the Curse of Prosperity. Uh, and so you get the search results and you'll see it's hitting results that are both in the, uh, here's a subject uh, result, something in the title, in the abstract, but you're getting it from the full text of the item as well. Let me go to uh, the project I was just telling you about and uh, Here's our Unearthing St. Augustine's Colonial Heritage. If you do a full text uh, here for, oh, let's try government. And then you can go in and, and uh, find the, uh, the item you want uh, based on the result. I'm going to do a newspaper search too. Let me come out and show you that. By the way, I just did that quickly, but I'm going to go back and do it again. I'm sorry if I'm clicking too fast sometimes, uh, so I, I hope I don't go too quickly. But you, you've got a link here at the top in this institutional bar, which will automatically get you back to the uh, UFDC home. Once you get down to a sub-collection level like this, the banner and everything has changed for uh, so that when you hit home here, you're going back to the collection level home. There is the option here uh, that drops down for at the sub-collection level to also get you back to the UFDC home. I usually just hit the little UFDC home link at the top there. And uh, let me show you another search. Here's our Florida Digital Newspaper Library. And this time it's done a little differently. So here's another way in which Sobek is very customizable. So in the newspaper search, you don't have text search on the bar. What you do is you have an option, and you'll notice that the default simple search has this drop-down box, telling, uh, allowing users to say, I just want to search a citation or the full text. And keeping with our example we've been using, here we are. I've searched basketball. We've got something from the Jasper News. And what's nice about this is that here's a case where we've got two different pages in the Jasper News from December 23rd, 2010. Uh, and you have each page comes up as a hit and you've got the context again. So Sobeck's pretty, uh, pretty user friendly in, in, in that regard, I, I think that uh, when you do searches, whether they're in the metadata search or in the full text, it's fairly easy to get to, uh, to, get to what you're after. Uh, and in, in the case of full text, it's extremely easy to find uh, exactly the point that you want to get to in the, uh, in the content. All right, uh, one other type of search I wanted to show you quickly, uh, and that is map searching. So uh, this is something that is available in a, in a couple of our collections uh, uh, right now. Let me over, jump over to DLock really quickly, and I'll show you that map searching is important enough to DLock that they've made it uh, one of the links in their menu on, the, on their home page. So basically, this is fairly straightforward. Let's say I'm a researcher. I want to come in and say, uh, Okay, what resources uh, might we have in the Digital Library of the Caribbean that are from or related to or from uh, Puerto Rico? All you have to do is press this first icon to select an area. So this is uh, 
I'm just going to draw a box here around Puerto Rico. Hit search. And here you have all of the resources that we've come up that geographically have been, I mean, excuse me, that have been described geographically as being relating to uh, that area I just drew. Let me do that one more time just so you see what I did there. So pick an area. Let me do, uh, well, let's do Havana, Cuba area. I'm going to say I'm going to press to select an area. I'm going to draw my point, pick my first point and my second point. And I'm going to hit search. And again, here are some items relating to Cuba that have come up in, in DLOC. Uh, you can do point searching as well. Uh, if you have a specific um, a city, for example, a city, a specific location, and, and you can drill down to quite a high level, so high that I'm out in the middle of the ocean somewhere. I'm in the Caribbean Sea. Uh, and you can select a specific point and say, let me know what you have for that. Uh, map searching is something that we're improving regularly. Uh, it's, uh, we have uh, at least two projects right now that are, we're working on, on our map uh, searching, and we've, we've got more that we're hoping to, uh, to uh, produce uh, in the future, more projects in the future that will lead to better uh, SOBEC support for map searching. Uh, another one that I'll just I'll mention here again because I, I just showed you, and that is the newspaper. Go back to that. Or the digital loot newspaper library. Here's a map browse feature. So in this case, not a map search as we were looking at in DLOC, but very similar in the sense that users can come in, and, and this is extremely useful, and, and I know that our folks here who work with the uh, with researchers who, who use do newspapers a lot, they love this feature. You can go in and you can say, okay, I just want to see which newspapers are held or, or were produced in particular areas. What's really useful about this is most people know that, you know, there might be a newspaper, the, the, the uh, Miami Herald, for example, in Miami, that's a known paper. What they might not know is that there were 15 other newspapers that were produced in the late 20th century in Miami that were much smaller productions or served particular ethnic communities, for example. And this is a good way to go in and say, uh, well, I clicked on the wrong button there. I wasn't drilled down far enough. Uh, so here's Biscayne Times, Biscayne Boulevard. Uh, and those are ones that you, know, you might not be able to find if you did a search on Miami readily. Uh, so uh, there, this is a really good, useful feature and a good way to allow discoverability through geographic metadata. Okay, I think I'm nearing a point for questions. I just want to check and make sure that I've covered all my all my bases here. Uh, query results we've covered. I'm doing good. All right, uh, before we start looking at the standard page view uh, I think it's a good point uh, to stop and ask for a few uh, questions if there are any. I, I've seen Mark's been able to answer a few already via chat. Uh, and I, I haven't seen any hands go up, but if there's anything, any questions, now's the time to ask them. Otherwise, I'm going to plow ahead rather quickly. All right. Uh, seeing none, since we have a lot of ground to cover, I'm just going to move on. Uh, <clears throat> next thing, uh, let's talk a little bit about the actual uh, uh, object views. I'm going to go in and show you some examples. I'm going to go live here and again, we'll use the uh, Baldwin Library. Uh, this is always a good example for us is because, you know, this is such a great image. How would you not want to show this to somebody? Uh, so basically, uh, this is a very standard uh, first, in, uh, first view for users when they're coming into the Sobex system and they find an object they want to look at. They're presented with a page image. It's usually in the case of a book, a, a cover, it, it, you know, maps, newspapers, that kind of thing. It's, it's, it's the first, the main image they're going to encounter. Uh, and then, <coughs> excuse me. There are all kinds of 
options for how to navigate that object, particularly if it's a complex multi-part object like a book might be. Uh, so really briefly, and again, I, I apologize, I'm going to move this, through this rather quickly, but the first way they can look at the, uh, they can move and, and, and interact with the object is through the menu options at the top. Um, the first thing they, they can do is the description uh, menu allows them to get to the uh, bibliographic uh, information, the metadata for the object, uh, and this is all just as good as, as you make it. So if you're the person responsible for uh, getting this content into, uh, into Sobec, then this is what the user is going to see. So keep that in mind. It's only as good as, as you make it. Uh, there are also use, I, I'm sure this is primarily more for internal uses, but it's available for the public as well, and that's, well, there's a mark view, a metadata view. I'm going to com come back and talk about statistics a little bit later. Um, then we have, uh, you can search, pardon me, with, ob with, uh, with objects that allow you to search within them. You can click on search, and that will allow you to do that. You can click on thumbnails. I'm, I'm, I, uh, I apologize. My, my browser's sitting here grinding away, not catching up with me. So here we go. Here's search. So you can search within the object. Uh, and thumbnails for quickly seeing the all of the thumbnails of the page, uh, page views for this particular item. Um, this is a pretty neat feature. I click, clicked on that rather quickly, so I'll go back. The page turner feature, primarily used for books. Uh, we're going to be using it with the diaries and the project I was talking about earlier, the Florida Diaries project. Uh, to me, this is just a really <clears throat> slick way for people to look through a book. You just, it's just clickable, you click on a side, you turn the page, and it just replicates the experience of uh, actually leafing through a book or a diary or whatever it might be. Uh, and then, uh, pardon me, come back over here to the main. So here's the standard one again, let's start over. I'm going to come back to page Im images quickly in a minute, but I wanted to show you first that to navigate through this, if you wanted to just look at image by image, you have multiple options here. The first is at the top above this image, you have uh, a drop-down menu. gives you all of the various components of the book, front cover, back cover, all the pages that are in between. You have the ability to actually page through next, last, first, previous. Over on the left, you have the table of contents. These are all the various divisions of the book. So it's easy to jump through and say, okay, I just want to get to the title page, skip the front matter. Um, you can go to the table of contents uh, within the book if it has one. Again, this is set by when, you, when we're putting the content into Sobec. Uh, this is not standard. You could have you know, maps, for example, won't have a table of contents. Uh, but a book, uh, we would set the metadata up so that each logical division within the book has, uh, has been identified and then it shows up in the table of contents, which by the way, is, as you noticed, is, is easily uh, hidden or revealed depending on how, <clears throat> how we want to set it up. A couple of other things I'll mention about the real estate here. Over on the right, you've got the typical share, add, send, print functions. Over on the left, this bar over here that's got the, uh, the uh, branding for the various um, um, partners or, fun or, or sponsors or funding agencies, uh, all of that, and it, however you want to get an attribution there for someone who was involved in getting this digital object uh, online and making it available, this is where you do that. So anybody who comes and finds this Tribulations of Tommy Tip Top can immediately see that, that this was um, funded by an NEH um, uh, funding here, at least in part. Uh, and this comes from special collections here at UF. It's in the Baldwin Library, for example. Uh, so this is an important thing to tell your partners uh, uh, that, that each of your uh, resources that go up in, in a partner project 
can be uh, branded in this way. Let's come back now to page images again, and let's say that let me say that the standard view is this page image here, but you can by either clicking on the menu option here or just by clicking on the image itself, you can then go into a zoomable view. And now I'm in the view here. You'll notice a thumbnail pops up over on the left. And using these options here, I can manipulate this image. And I can, I can make it a larger zoom. I can make it a larger size. So you can get to a very high level of resolution here. Uh, and let me come down a couple of at this point. I've got it zoomed in here. You'll notice that in the thumbnail over here, uh, this blue bounding box has appeared. By moving that, by clicking here, you can then easily navigate where you're looking at in the zoomed in image on the right. Uh, and then, of course, there are other options like this will allow you to incrementally move to the right, the left, up, down. You can rotate the image. So, pretty powerful way to for for individuals to actually uh, look at the zoomable view of of the page images. All right, uh, I think that's sure. I didn't miss anything there. Time's sake. Okay, let's move back to the PowerPoint. I throw these slides in just in case we have any technical difficulties. I can just run my presentation right off the slides. So it's always nice when I go out and do the live view and I come back and I'm like, oh, I did hit everything I had intended to. Uh, let me go out and uh, I'm going to show you a few things uh, that I'll just talk about briefly and then, and then show you quickly. And that is that uh, for some uh, material, some resources, the view is going to be slightly different than others. The best example of that might be a journal or a newspaper where in addition to having the elements that I just showed you earlier, uh, you might also have uh, issue information, a year, a month, uh, a particular volume, for example. Um, it's gone over that. Ooh, that was very good. I'm, I knocked that out pretty well. So let's go really quickly and let me show you the newspaper. Uh, again, I'm, I'm using this example. Uh, by the way, the uh, one of the things that I find useful a lot of times when I go into a collection or sub-collection is you can just select view items, view all items, um, and that allows you to pull up everything that's in that collection. In this case, uh, we have 743 matching titles, and if you go in here is a Alachua Advocate a newspaper that was published in 1883. This might not be the best example here of what I was going to show you because it's a single volume. Uh, here we go. Here's a good example. Alachua County Today, you'll notice here in the search results that you have a uh, a, uh, the expandable boxes here. And so in addition to saying, oh, we've got 198 issues of this one title, that within that, 2007 has March through December, 2008, and so on and so forth. And so once you're in Alachua County today, the default view, <coughs> excuse me, is not to show you a page view. The default view is to show you this tree view uh, of, the, uh, of the various issues. Um, again, this is just dependent on uh, as you go from one resource to the next, the, the, it's going to change a little bit in terms of the default view that uh, a user might see. Okay. I uh, have talked about a lot of these already, so I'm not going to talk about these too much, but I just wanted to make sure that we covered all the various resources that typically are, we, we encounter the most in, you have in, uh, in Sobex CM. Um, Photographs, I've already shown you uh, some examples of that and how you can zoom into uh, uh, images. Uh, it's very similar to the book uh, example I just showed you, so I'm not going to go out and do a live view of that. Um, one interesting thing is this Map It feature. And 
I can actually show you that here. Uh, let me go back to uh, this Alachua Advocate. You'll notice that this new menu option has popped up here. If I click Map It, because we have the geographic data uh, about where Alachua uh, Advocate was published, we have a marker here that this is started out on a low level, but and you can switch from map to satellite view. This is a very typical Google API uh, here where anybody who's used Google Maps will know how to use this. You can switch from the map to the satellite view and you can zoom in, zoom out. But this is a, a pinpoint here in, in, in uh, Alachua County, uh, Florida. So the map it view, again, a, a really powerful way to to combine to combine geo uh, spatial information uh, with the digital objects. All right, I've shown you newspapers. Uh, it's uh, I, I, it's very scalable. Uh, for example, we have over seventeen thousand issues. Uh, I'm not going to even say that because I will butch butcher it. My ability to uh, to speak other languages is horrendous. So I will just say that we have over 17,000 issues of that paper. Uh, I've shown you newspapers. Uh, I'm going to... Mark, are you, are you, do you want to say a word about this again, this title issue relationship? Yeah, I think you explained this better than I do. If you're there, if not, I'll skip it and come back to it later. Right, so the, um, we added the ability to have this hierarchy where you have essentially a title, um, like the Tampa Tribune or something, and then each individual issue underneath that. And there's quite a bit of flexibility how issues get attached to titles. Basically, you can populate a, a hierarchical tree to say how you want them to be attached. Um, quite often for newspapers, it's just is the year, month, day. But we st once we had that in place, we started looking at other things. Obviously, serials make sense where you have volumes and issues. But you can see we actually started using this hierarchy as well for archival materials and photographs, books that are related to each other, aerials. So once we sort of had that hierarchical title issue relationship, um, it sort of cross-pollinated the rest of the system so that it became quite useful in many other ways. Uh, and we are going to explore some of those ways in the third session of this, we'll talk about um, not only how to use it for newspapers a little bit, but um, really other cases that we found it useful to use. Great, thanks, Mark. All right. Uh, let's see here, I'm gonna I'm gonna just show you that we have <clears throat> map views. Uh, that's another resource that we, we serve up rather well, in my opinion, and we're improving that drastically even now as we speak. We have a grant project that's, uh, that's allowing us to develop uh, some programming to support how maps are, are, are displayed in, in Sobexium and, and how users can interact with them. And there's going to be a lot more coming on that um, in, in the near future. Um, it's not terribly different than the view I just showed you earlier where you could zoom in and and, and uh, get to a high level of, of uh, detail. Uh, so I'm not going to go out and show you, uh, so show a live version of that right now. Uh, aerial photographs, very similar to the uh, map search I, I showed earlier. Uh, what's nice about this is that our aerial photographs uh, projects, uh, we've had uh, several projects in the past where we've been able to scan a lot of our photographs, aerial photographs. We've built an entire search interface around them that allows people to come in and search for particular <clears throat> uh, geographic regions and see all of the various flight paths that went over those regions and they can they can search and select just particular um, uh, a particular flight path and within that flight path particular tiles and they just want to see images covering a, a very specific geographic area. Um, Here's a good example of that, where they've said Alachua County, it's flight six from 1937, and there are one, two, three, what is that, four, four different um, um, tiles there that, that match their criteria. Uh, quickly, some other formats, uh, audio. Uh, here's an example here where we have an interview that's available in uh, a WAV file format. Um, we have video, 
and uh, video again you can have that uh, you know an MPEG file for example and uh, in this case this is streaming video so the the player um, it shows up right in in uh, the Sobek uh, display uh, uh, artifacts uh, this one is actually really cool in my opinion so I'm going to click out and show you this one So we we have the ability to if we have a 3D object like this one we can shoot it in the round we can shoot it 360 and our our this was done here in our digital library center at at uh, University of Florida and uh, the team there they're they're fantastic and I could have another whole session just talking about how the great work they do but here's an example where they uh, shot an object in the round at 360 and this is made up of multiple multiple individual images and then they're all put together in this animated view uh, showing it uh, that it, it can be rotated. Uh, you can stop it wherever you want and you can also you can click on a particular image so you can then you have the option once you found the side you want to look at you can zoom in and look at that particular object in detail go back spin it around look for an another side you want to look at and uh, here are all of the however many dozens, hundreds of images it takes to make up that animated view. Okay, so that's pretty cool. And then, as I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, data sets. We've uh, we're just rolling this out now. Uh, development's ongoing for this, but. Basically, the idea is that uh, we're, we want uh, Sobex CM to support the uh, capturing uh, and, and discoverability of, for data sets uh, as well as any other resource that's out there. So, uh, so even though data sets might be uh, on the face a little more complicated than uh, most people can wrap their head around how you would present a photograph or a map, uh, a data set's a little bit more uh, Difficult uh, at first glance, but we're uh, we're far along that path in terms of making Sobex CM um, uh, support that as well. Uh, Mark Sullivan's the person definitely to ask about this. Uh, Lori's been Lori Taylor has been working on this quite a bit, so I'm not going to make a fool of myself and and try and speak about it too much. But uh, you should know that. Uh, not only can you get your data set in there, but it preserves the relationships, the fields, uh, so that the, the tables can be uh, replicated if, if you've got uh, tabular data, for example. Okay. All right. Everything I've done so far has been uh, basically on the on the user. It's all, it's all been on the user side, and uh, I haven't talked at all about um, about what the, the powerful options that are added when you get uh, users who log in and particularly as curators and collection managers what happens when we log in so let's talk now about my UFDC and I'm again I'm gonna go out and just show you this so one of the things you'll notice I'm gonna go to the home page but this shows up on every page in, in uh, the UF instance if you're there or if you're in DLock uh, you can log in with DLock um, with DLock it's over here on the left my DLock home. So in any instance of Sobek, you have this ability to log in, and uh, this is this supports uh, Shibboleth, and and uh, there are multiple ways you can log in here. I'm just going to log in with my. I'm logging into UFDC right now. So. Uh, one thing you'll no, you'll notice when I log in the, the the landing page that I that 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 I hit once I've logged in is it gives me a lot of options that I did not have before when I was an un uh, when I was not logged in as a user. Um, I, I'm going to come back to these first two uh, about uh, creating and, and submitting items. Uh, I'm going to jump down a little bit and, and talk a little bit. As I said earlier, um, you can save searches, you can save search results, all of that that you want to save using uh, using options like 
add, for example, those I've shown you these a few different places uh, like these, uh, this is where it ends up in your in your my UFDC. So you can go and you can see what's in your bookshelf. And the bookshelf includes my saved searches uh, or objects that I've saved as well. So here's an example here where I've got one. I can't remember why I have one called UPS Ups. Uh, and I've got a couple of different uh, objects uh, uh, that I've saved to that. I've got, if I had saved searches, uh, which I do actually, uh, I can click on my saved searches and it click on it and it reruns the search for me. Again, very handy if you're doing a lot of instruction uh, work where you're having to make presentations. It might be nice to have a saved search, particularly a complicated search uh, where you can um, get to information. Uh, replicate the search easily and get to the information without having to hunt for it in front of an audience. Um, you've got uh, preferences you can set. But what I really want to talk about is the uh, when you go to the My Library, My Collections, this is what's really important to me as a collection manager, is that any collection in Sobek that I'm assigned to be a uh, some uh, somebody who ad administers that collection in some way, whether it's at a high level or low level of administration, those show up on this page. So I can see that uh, you know I'm a primary collection manager for this America Swamp project that we had here at the University of Florida, uh, and I can easily get to that collection. So I think this is a very useful way for me to get in and see all the collections that I'm I'm responsible for in, in some way. Um, let's go back over. Uh, let's see. I'm going to jump now. I'm going to go back out to the UFDC homepage. Oh, sorry, I did that click twice on by accident. Well, let me just do it this way. Okay. Another thing you'll notice now that I'm logged in, so you'll see that it says John's My UFDC right here. This gray bar has now appeared at the top of the, uh, of the screen, and you can hide that if you want. This is our header for when you're logged in, this is what um, is going to allow you to do ha have more options that you'll be able to use. I'm going to come back and talk about this more later, but I'll quickly show you. Um, so. Let me go to one of my collections, actually. I'm going to go to my library. Oh, I keep clicking on the wrong thing. Pardon me. I'm going to go into my collections. Let's go into America's Swamp. You'll notice the gray bar at the top has now changed, and there are some new commands that I'll be able to use. And then now this is also a good point where I'll just mention quickly that this is a, uh, this is a good point where I can get to statistics about uh, the information that I'm I'm uh, that I'm looking at the the either the collections or the specific objects there are usage usage statistics that are captured at all levels uh, very fine levels all the way up to collection wide levels and so uh, for the user who's not logged in these statistics um, uh, they can look at particularly collection wide statistics at the bottom of the page. Once you're logged in, we as collection managers have uh, the ability to look at usage statistics uh, for a collection, and you have all kind of options for what you want to look at here, <coughs> whether that's views of the collection of the items, which titles were the top ones look, looked at. It's by it's um, a temporal list, so you can see uh, by month and year, uh, what what your hits were, unique views, that kind of thing. I'm not going to talk about stats too much for time's sake, so um, let's move on. You get an item count at the top. All right. And quickly, I'll just show you a few items. I'm going to go into an item here. And now at the object level, you'll see that this menu bar up here has changed yet again, where I can go in and as the collection manager, as the person who has permission to do this, I can go in and edit the metadata. I can edit behaviors. I can do some quality control. 
and, uh, and other kind of, of management on this object. This is the kind of thing where um, you'd have to, uh, whoever, permissions have to be set is what I'm trying to say, for who has access to do these, these uh, administrative uh, functions. So really quickly, let me just show you. And again, this is what I'm going to go over very quickly right now in the next uh, five to ten minutes. This is something that uh, Mark Sullivan and Lori and I are going to be talking about in greater depth in workshops two, three, and four. So online metadata editing, that's all going to be covered in, in workshop two. Okay, uh, metadata editing is very, very simple. Online editor where you have all of these uh, um, empty boxes, which some of them you can have, they're repetitive, so you can click the add and have uh, more. Some of uh, more fields appear. Um, you can have, we have drop down options. Um, you have, look to, to the different tab, you've got larger, uh, text entry like note fields for example where you can say well this is a note about donation and then you can uh, paste in a paragraph there or type in a paragraph whatever it might be subject keywords and so on and so forth um, basically all the metadata that I've ever wanted to get into an object I've been able to do through the online metadata editor here let's go let me cancel out of here Edit behaviors. This is where you can set, for example, a thumbnail that you want to appear in the search result. Uh, um, if you have uh, um, uh, objects that's part of a has a hierarchy to it, you can set that. Um, if you um, here's something if, if this item was born digital, you know, for example, a, a, a digital photograph that was taken, you can check that. Uh, what aggregation the, the object belongs to, an aggregation, and I'm going to go up and show you that right now. This particular object has multiple aggregations, and you'll see the bar here. It's part of the Fred Williamson papers. It's been scanned as part of the America Swamp Project, which was a a, uh, hierarchically, we have decided that's part of Florida history and heritage within the University of Florida Digital Collections. And so this particular object, if we go back now to the uh, behaviors page, you'll see this is where that is managed. It's part of Florida Heritage, uh, uh, Florida heritage uh, Collection, Swamp, uh, the Williamson Aggregation, and I don't know if there's a limit to this, but I've, I've never found one, and I've seen some objects that uh, have uh, more, aggreg more aggregations that they're assigned to than this. Source institution, and so, so on and so forth. Cancel out of this. Let's talk about quality control really quickly. Uh, let's go back to this uh, example we were looking at earlier. This is a book, the Tommy Tip Top book. And if we go into quality control now, this QC tool has just been rolled out. And it is uh, extremely powerful and it's something that as a collection manager I've wanted for quite a while. And in the past if I found there was an issue, like for example during scanning uh, or during um, uh, uh, putting the materials into Sobek, putting the digital pages into Sobek. Let's say two pages in a, in a 500 page work where the order was messed up, they, they were swapped. I've, I would have to go back to our, our digital unit and say, okay, here, you got to go to pages 312 and 313 and switch the order. And uh, they were always very responsive and great, but it would have been so much better if I could have just done it myself. Now I have the ability to do that. This QC tool, which will be the subject of our third workshop, allows me to go in as the collection manager uh, and I can move uh, uh, pages around uh, and I can assign divisions. I'm going to actually go to a slightly bigger view than this one so you can, you can see this. Uh, I can scroll through this entire book here and I could say, uh-oh, we got the order wrong that this image was supposed to come 
uh, before the table of contents and the original that's the way it is and the page numbers got messed up I can then move this and put it in front of the uh, in its correct location and I can make sure that the it's it's marked as a division properly that this is yes a table of contents and it should appear in the table of contents for the user um, so this is a really uh, powerful way for collection managers to actually get in and make sure that the the digital uh, surrogate uh, actually reflects the original and, and correct mistakes like this uh, for the public um, okay uh, again, this is topic of workshop three, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this. I will tell you that this has just been rolled out, and it's it's something I've, I've been waiting for for a while, and I, I think it's a really great advancement for for Sobek. Okay, uh, I have jumped a little bit out of order in terms uh, so that we make sh I make sure we can cover everything we're supposed to. Uh, I want to quickly skim through and make sure that I've hit everything that I wanted to. Uh, I got way out of order. Searching. Talked about statistics. Uh, okay, so how do we get the information into uh, Sobec? Uh, basically, there's three different methods. One is self-submittal. The best example of that is uh, here at UF, we have an institutional repository that's fairly standard for a lot of uh, institutions, uh, Digital Library of Car the Caribbean, the partners, they can self-submit. Basically, I'm going to take you back now to my UFDC page. And these were the two commands I skipped earlier under uh, my UFDC home. I say I want to start a new item. The, de the default here at UF is that I'm going to be submitting it to our institutional repository, the, the IR at UF here. And the template I'm going to use is the IR template. However, this is, again, very customizable. And so I could, ha I could have any number of templates set up. You just have to work with Mark Sullivan to get this to happen. But here are some of the ones that we have already. So the oral history template, for example, is going to come up. And it's going to look different than the IR template it's going to be asking for things that are specific only to oral histories. Uh, oh, shouldn't have hit back. Uh, or DLOC is going to have a slightly different uh, template than the IR, and so on and so forth. This is a way for if you have a single object or a few ob handful of objects and you want to get them in easily to UFDC, you can self-submit. This is a perfectly valid way to do it. Uh, many of us here at UF do this all of the time with the IR. Okay. Uh, and the other two ways are the bulk imports. And these are, uh, these are much easier if you're dealing with volume, of course, bulk. Uh, the first is the import spreadsheet. This is... Uh, skip and show you an example of that. This is an easy way if you just have a like an, a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet, for example, or any kind of tabular spreadsheet that you can assign fields that match or can be mapped to the Sobek fields, and you put all of your content in there, then um, that spreadsheet can be imported right into Sobek. We do this regularly with our uh, archival collections. For example, here's an example of that diary project I was talking about at the beginning of the session, where we have all of the diaries, we have the metadata, and this can be imported right into Sobec. Uh, the collection manager can create all of this at once, and then the digital scanned images can be attached to the metadata in Sobec. And then the third one is harvesting. Again, very useful if you're dealing in volume. If you already have a bunch of books, for example, that are uh, described in MARC and they're in your OPAC uh, or in OCLC, for example, then uh, Sobek can just grab all of the catalog records and bring in all of that MARC uh, metadata uh, right into Sobek, and the digital images, again, can be attached. OK. Uh, here's an example really quickly for that spreadsheet importer where we can map whatever the field titles are in the import spreadsheet. We can hopefully map them to their corresponding um, field in Sobek. 
Okay. Uh, I've already talked about that. Finally, and I know I'm running a little long here, but I just wanted to tell you the latest thing that I'm, I think is an amazing development, and that's the admin view. Uh, so going once again back to uh, my UFDC, I'm going to go to my, my collections. I'm going to go to America Swamp. The admin view icon at the top. This has just been rolled out. It gives me all the power I might ever want and probably too much power uh, in order to customize how my collection looks and feels. Uh, so what happens is you go to Mark Sullivan and you say, okay, I, I want to have, uh, I'm a collection manager for this project. He sets you up with the admin rights for uh, your, your collection. This gives me full control over the look and feel within a certain extent, of course, within Sobex parameters. But basically, I can put whatever text I want. Uh, I can uh, change the banner at the top, submit a new banner. I can handle, this is where you say, I want full text search to be my default, and you take away the basic search. Uh, this is where um, you can say, I want you know, seven facets as my default over on the, in my search results on the left. Uh, and again, this is collection wide. So this, this gives you the ability to manage the look and feel and the interface for your particular collection that you manage. Uh, what skin is going to be used, the, the, the uh, language, the uh, here again, here's the banner I was talking about earlier, where you can change the banner uh, depending on the language. Uh, that highlights feature, feature I showed you, that rotating image feature that appears on the main UFDC page. This is where you can set that up for your collection. Uh, you can decide if you're going to have what children exist under your collection and subcollections. Uh, so right now there are the seven subcollections under the swamp. Uh, collection and we and I have the ability to manage those from here I can set up a new collection I can get rid of these collections again this is all permissions based so uh, um, you can work with Mark uh, or whoever your administrator is maybe Mark and somebody else uh, or, or just somebody else to set up all these permissions so that uh, you can do you can't do too much harm to your materials also, I should mention, I, I, don't, I think I neglected to show you this. Let me go back. I'm just going to cancel here. One of the things that will happen that's a little different in new up that's been rolled out newly as well is that now when I'm signed in as a collection manager for America Swamp, if I put my uh, mouse cursor over the text here in the body of this page, you'll notice that it's being highlighted and this pops up excuse me, where I can edit the content. And this is a straightforward, quick and dirty little um, uh, text HTML editor that I can go in and, and just edit that portion of my collection landing page. So between the admin view and this, you know, the, the, you're the, really the look and feel of your collection pages is at your fingertips. I hate to sound corny, but that's basically the case. Um, okay. I know we're down to just a couple minutes, and I hope some of you can stay over and take some questions. I apologize for going a little long, but uh, let me quickly make sure uh, that I've covered all the main highlights. Uh, we can restrict access by IP address. So in this case, this is an example from New College where they have uh, theses, uh, theses that are restricted so that people only on campus that have their IP address have access to those. Branding, I've already shown you some examples of branding where here's the new college's look and feel and uh, here's an example of a, a local historical society and, and, and their instance, uh, their, their, uh, um, their Sobek uh, interface. Okay, I'm going to skip through that. One of the nice things uh, is that uh, uh, Sobek allows for very clean, simple URLs. So you can have a collection 
for example, the first two examples there are, are in uh, UFDC and it's just slash aerial slash newspapers. Very easy to give somebody that URL and not be embarrassed by uh, a, uh, a, a long uh, chain of, of slash so-and-so slash so-and-so slash so-and-so. You can do that at a subcollection level. So you could say slash Williamson, and that would be the Fred Williamson papers, which exists within the swamp, which exists within the Florida Heritage uh, Collection, for example. Also, it allows for pearls so that uh, uh, these objects will be findable from this point going forward uh, with that, that uh, particular pearl. I'm not going to talk too much about this, again, for time's sake, but uh, you should be aware that uh, it has an integrated tracking and reporting system so that basically all the information you need is at your fingertips as a collection manager. Um, one of the things that I do like about Sobek is that I get, an, as a collection manager, I get an automated email uh, monthly stating uh, usage uh, statistics for my items uh, and that just automatically is generated and, and sent to me via email. You can, by the way, as a collection manager, get in and look at statistics relating to production as well, uh, which is very important. You can track where your objects are in, in, a, in a queue, for example, a scanning queue and a QC queue. <coughs> it's a good thing we're running out of time because I think I'm about to lose my voice. Uh, okay, so finally, let me close with uh, that we are in the process of working with EAD, uh, Encoded Archival Description for Archival Materials. As I mentioned earlier, we're, we're just going gangbusters working on our, our GIS and, and uh, geographic, uh, geospatial uh, interface and, and ability to to uh, serve up and, and make maps and other geographic-based information usable. Um, I already mentioned the date support for searches. Uh, we're integrating with Sunshine State and Common Core educational standards. And then uh, finally, we've got uh, SOBEC instances being served by the uh, Florida Virtual Campus, uh, which is the, uh, it's the unit here in the state of Florida that serves all of the state universities and, and colleges, uh, um, our technical and, and online needs. All right. Uh, thank you so much for bearing with me running over a little bit. Uh, I um, should have had more opportunities for questions, but I'm here now and we can stay a little later. I think that's going to be okay with Mark. I'll close by just saying that although Lori Taylor and myself were good people to go to, and I can certainly give you the perspective as a collection manager, <clears throat> Mark is the lead developer for Sobek. So clearly, if there's one person that you may want to make your go-to person, it should be Mark. Um, and then finally, there is a discussion group for SOBEC, and the URL is here. This entire uh, PowerPoint is available in UFDC. If you go to UFDC and search for SOBEC and curators, for example, you will hit this. Uh, and then I can also, uh, Mark or I can provide the link, direct link to this uh, uh, if needed. All right, so uh, are there any questions? I'm sorry we were going quickly and I was trying to cover a lot of ground, but I, I I think come back for number two, three, and four in the series, and that's where you're going to get a lot of the in-depth uh, 